So recall that we can have a couple of different situations when we plot functions. So here's f of x that we'll plot. Uh, we can have a situation where we have the function being very nicely behaved, and then suddenly at this point we have an instantaneous jump over here. See, the difference between this and this, as soon as you reach this point, boom, you jump right up there at the point A. Okay. So we know from experience that if we take the left-hand limit, we're going to get this value. If we take the right-hand limit, we'll get this value. And because they don't match the limit as x approaches a of this function f of x does not exist. And we've talked about that very uh, frequently in the last section. So we already know that. Okay. But there's another situation over here that I know that you also know. We're just kind of reviewing a little bit. x and f of x. Okay. So we can have a situation where the function does not have any kind of discontinuous jump. It might just continue like this. You see I've kind of connected the dots here and the function just kind of continues. And at the same value a, right, if we have this situation, then we would basically say the limit uh, as x approaches a from the left of this function is equal to the limit as x approaches a from the right of this function, right? Which is also equal to the, what we call now the two-sided limit of f of x. And we say that it exists, and its value is just whatever we calculate coming from the left, coming from the right, they're going to meet in the middle, and that is the value of what we call the two-sided limit. So in one case, we have a limit that doesn't exist, or the two-sided limit does not exist. Uh, and this two limit side of limit doesn't exist here. Now when I say the limit doesn't exist, I mean the two sided limit. Of course the left hand limit exists and the right hand limit exists, but put together these guys do not exist as a two sided limit here. So the one thing you can kind of surmise from looking at this is this function, just from looking at it, looks to be a very smooth and continuous function. What I mean by that is everywhere you trace your finger, you don't run into any gaps or any discontinuous jumps. Whereas if you come here, you hit a discontinuous jump, you know that that's not a very well behaved function. So a definition that you'll find in your book is a function is continuous at a point. Uh, the point we're always talking about is the point A, if, and I know you can guess the punchline because we've drawn it on the board, if the limit as x approaches A of f of x, okay, get ready for the punchline, is equal to the function evaluated at A. Okay, make sure you understand what that's basically saying. Because I've I've kind of hinted so many times and kind of I taught you this without even really telling you I was teaching it. I basically told you over and over and over again, I said, think of a polynomial, it's always smooth and continuous. And when you're evaluating the limit, you just plug in the value. That's the limit, okay? You only really have to worry if you get these weird discontinuous jumping functions or if you get zero over zero, you have to do a little more work. But ultimately, if it's smooth and continuous and well behaved, you should just be able to plug in the value into the function and that's going to be the value of the limit. That's all it's saying. So it's saying is a function is continuous at a point A if you can find its limit by just plugging in the value at that point, which is the case here, right here. Okay. Uh, and then it's a little bit weird, but you always see stuff like this. A function is uh, discontinuous. if it isn't, if it isn't continuous. That's kind of common sense, but that's what you'll see in your book, so I'm going to write it down. So that's the bottom line, ladies and gentlemen. If you have a function, and if you can approach from the left and approach from the right, or the right and you get the same thing, then the limit, the two-sided limit exists there, and that also implies that it's a smooth function, or a continuous function is now the word we're going to use, which also implies that I can just take the value of a and stick it in there. Now, you've used all this before, but we haven't formalized it as a definition. So we're kind of making the circle complete. We're coming back to what you kind of already know from what we've done with the problems, and we're just formalizing it in terms of a definition. Now, note, there's some notes here I want to tell you about. None of these should be very uh, earth-shattering, but I'm going to write them down because you'll come across in your book. When you have a smooth and continuous function, or I should say if, you have two functions, f and g, and they're both continuous, right? If you have two continuous functions, then you have a bunch of things you can write down. You can say 
f plus g, f minus g, a constant c times the function f, um, f times g, or f divided by g, all of these kind of functions that you can define in terms of f and g, they are all continuous as well. That's actually really important because as we've seen, finding limits is very easy to do if the function is continuous. Very easy to do. All you do is you plug in the value. And what we're saying is if you have two functions that you already know to be continuous, then you can either add them, subtract them, multiply them, divide them, or multiply them times a constant number, and the resulting function that you get from that is also continuous. So if you know, for instance, that sine is continuous, and you know that cosine is continuous, then you also know that sine divided by cosine is also continuous. You also know that sine plus cosine is continuous. You also know that 5 times the sine is continuous. You know that 5 times the sine plus cosine is continuous, all divided over another cosine or something. So you have lots of different... Um, this multiplies the amount of continuous functions that you know, and that is why most of the functions that we've done in one form or another, you've been able to basically just plug in the value because all polynomials behave this way. Almost all trig functions, and tangent isn't uh, like that because it goes to infinity, but sine and cosine are, are continuous, and so on. The list goes on. I just said something a minute ago that I want to write down as a definition. Um, it's something I've told you a few times, but all polynomials which is actually the, probably the largest class of functions that we study, are continuous from negative infinity to infinity. So whatever you can make up, whatever your little heart desires, you can have x to the 10th minus 7x to the 4th plus 5x to the 3rd plus 2x, whatever. Any polynomial you can come up with, you automatically know it's continuous. We're not going to prove that. That's something that mathematicians have automatically proven using limit theory. Um, but, you know, it's very useful because then you know if you want to take the limit of this thing, you can just plug in the value. And here's another important guy. All rational functions uh, are continuous where it is defined. Remember I've told you a couple times what is a rational function. A rational function is just simply a function that can be written like a fraction. So you might have for instance x squared plus 2 over x minus 4. Uh, you may have all kind of wondered as we were doing a lot of problems uh, like how did I know that I could just plug in values into those? Well it turns out that all polynomials are continuous and all rational functions which can be written in terms of a fraction are also continuous. So you know this is continuous, you know this is continuous, you know all rational functions are continuous and the only place that this function is not really uh, defined to be continuous is that x is equal to 4 because if you put a 4 here then this bottom is going to go to 0, this thing goes to infinity. So it's not defined at that point. We say it's not defined, really the function goes to infinity at that point. And so we can't define a limit at that point because we've already talked about the fact that you can't define a limit at that or you can define the limit but it just goes to infinity. Uh, so if you approach from the left or approach from the right, what you're going to find here is that you're going to get different values. So the limit here at 4 does not exist. The two-sided limit doesn't exist there. In any case, outside of this weird oddball place, x is equal to 4, you automatically know from this theorem that this function is continuous everywhere else. So if we're trying to find the limit as x approaches 10, you can just plug in the value. If you're trying to find the limit as x approaches 0, you can just plug in the value. Because the only place that this rational function isn't defined is that x is equal to 4, and we automatically know from this theorem that it is defined everywhere else. So just wanted to kind of uh, give you that because you'll see a chapter in your book talking about continuity of functions, but it's kind of just rehashing the same old stuff again. We've talked about two-sided limits and how they behave, and that's why we wanted to do this section. So we have finished our batch of lessons on limits in Calculus 1. Um, Limits are fundamental to understanding the detailed concepts behind other things in calculus. You'll learn limits now and then you'll use them constantly because you'll use them in taking the derivative and learning about the concept of a derivative. But the truth is, is once you kind of get past the initial part of the derivative theory, you don't use limits quite so much. But they're still useful to understand because everything else is, in calculus is really built upon the idea of a limit. We've talked about how to take basic limits with substitution. 
We've talked about how to factor and cancel the expressions to get the limits. We've talked about the left-hand limits and the right-hand limits and the two-sided limits. And we've talked about the definition of a limit, which is very daunting if you, if you don't have someone to help you understand it. So I hope that I've been able to make this a little bit easier for you. Um, the biggest piece of advice I can tell you as you march on through calculus is to work a lot of problems. Nobody can do well in calculus by solving one or two problems and, oh yeah, I'm ready for the test. No, you really be, should be working everything that I'm working on a separate sheet of paper after you've watched me work it. And then grab your book, open it. You've got dozens of other problems. Whatever book you're using, you'll have lots of extra problems, whether they're examples or if they're the odd number problems in the back. Work a lot of problems. And then follow me on as you finish your study of limits here. I've got en entire course sequences that cover all of the derivatives and integrals and calculus one, two, and three. So no matter how far you're going in math, I've got you covered on that. And I'll take everything step by step, break it into example problems as we go along through the sequence. So follow me along and good luck on your journey in calculus. I hope I've made it a little bit easier for you and you can help yourself by doing lots and lots of example problems. So make sure you follow that advice as you work through your calculus studies. Learn anything at mathandscience.com.